Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session on the resurgence of the Taliban. I am Frédéric Graab, the director of the South Asia program here at the Carnegie Endowment. We are happy to welcome you here this morning, and I must tell you from the very beginning that this event is co-sponsored with the organization Indus, and a good friend of Sanabas will say a few words about it earlier. So what this session is about is the launching of this book, The Taliban Revival, Violence and Extremism on the Pakistan-Afghan Frontier. This is indeed a timely book, or maybe not so much a timely book. Actually, I don't know, because we arrive at the end of a cycle. This cycle is the cycle of Western intervention in Afghanistan. This is definitely not the end of the Afghan conflict. Or we can hope it will be the end of the Afghan conflict, but unless we believe our own propaganda, this is not likely to be so in the months to come. So since the end of 2001, I mean, a lot of people have died in Afghanistan, both Western, Afghan, and people from the region. A lot of billions have been spent in Afghanistan. All of that was made to eradicate the Taliban. And where are we standing today? I mean, I know that the focus these days in the country is mostly about the election and what is going wrong in this election. But it will have escaped none of you that what we see actually is a resurgence of the Taliban in both the South and the East. Well, none of us can be really surprised since they were, you know, massive formation in both the places. But I mean, the point is not whether this is the case, we know what's going on, or we try to know what's going on, we certainly don't know everything. Uh, the question is whether, does this mean that almost 13 years of war in Afghanistan, of additional war in Afghanistan, have served no purpose? I mean, have the Taliban been eradicated? Definitely not. Does it mean that the Western intervention was useless? Perhaps not. Does it mean that it was a success? That's definitely a different story. And this is what this book in many ways is about. How did we get to the situation that we are in now? How did we get to a situation that a movement that everybody in 2002 thought had been more or less eradicated, or what was left of it was essentially residual? How is it that this movement has come up again and so on? And this is what the book of Hassan Abbas is about. And I'm happy to say that this is an attempt to bring a quite objective perspective on the way things have moved, looking at different angles. And this is this multidimensional aspect of the book which makes, in my opinion, its, uh, its interest. So it looks in particular at what? The role of Kabul. Yeah, this is something that is being very discussed about. The role of Western policy, again, this is something which is slightly less discussed. Today we tend to say we live with a sense of mission accomplished, or so we'd like to believe. The role of the military in decision making, and so on and so forth. So for that matter, we are delighted today to welcome the author Hassan Abbas. And uh, let me say, well, for most of you, or many of you at least, he, is, he doesn't need an introduction. Let me say that he's the professor and chair of the Department of Regional and Analytical Studies at the National Defense University College of International Security Affairs here in Washington, D.C. He is also a senior advisor at the Asia Society. He previously served as the distinguished Quedi Azam professor at Columbia University and a senior advisor at the Belfer Center for Science and International uh, Affairs at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Well, to me, what is more important is that he's a very prolific writer, and many of you remember his first book, Pakistan Drift into Extremism. So with those words, I will now stand between you and the speaker and ask Hassan, please, to come up and present your book. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's a great privilege um, and honor to be here and to see many friends and, and for so many of us to be able to find time. Um, in the beginning, I'll also mention I'm not only thankful to Carnegie and to Frederick, um, who's an old friend, and um, his work has been guiding many of us. Um, his bold and courageous um, writings were a source of inspiration for um, 
scholars of South Asian studies. Um, I'm also very thankful to the organization Indus. Uh, Mr. Atar Javed is sitting here. This is a newer organization, uh, a think tank, an advocacy group. Um, and one good thing and one different thing about this organization is it's primarily uh, based on Pakistani Americans, but they um, are benefiting from the expertise and, and the guidance of many uh, of the scholars of South Asian descent, Aisha Jalal and ma many of the other scholars. And they, are, they believe in making Pakistan um, a progressive state and also building uh, the US-Pakistan relations. So thank you very much, Mr. Arthur. Um, and I wish you best of luck in your endeavors. Um, my plan in next about 30 to 40 minutes is to first give you um, a gist um, of the main arguments of my book, if I may call that, um, and also briefly talk about my, my recent visit, which was uh, kind of a book tour. Um, I landed in, I planned to land in Pakistan um, for about 15 days, but also had an opportunity to go to Iraq um, two days after Mosul was taken over. Um, I had an opportunity to speak um, to parliamentarians in, in Iraq and to the law enforcement agencies. Um, and some of the things that I heard, and I, it's, it's not that I'm just mentioning about Iraq, uh, the linkages between the Pakistani Taliban and the, this new militant or terrorist group, um, which is, they claim to have built a new state, um, it, it's very, very interesting. Some of the slogans that have started coming up on the streets in Iraq are in Urdu language. The, the linkage with the Pakistani Taliban is very obvious. So I'll, I'll talk somewhat about, or briefly about some of those linkages as, as well. Um, first and foremost, I must add, um, a disclaimer in, in a sense also about my background, other than my academic career in the United States, I had the great honor and privilege to have served as a uh, police chief, uh, uh, police officer in Pakistan's tribal areas. This was between 1995 and 1997. Um, and some of my ideas, my thoughts um, are, are based upon that. And one of the um, understandings with my publisher was that the Yale University Press, which, which um, greatly helped me in conceiving the idea, uh, they, they wanted it to be an academic book, but also have, have some of the ideas, some of the stories, some of the um, ideas from, from the field. Um, so I have a lot many anecdotes in the book from that region as well. But what I want to begin with is, um, I have traveled around the world, lived in many major cities around the world, um, but my experience of having lived with the Pashtuns or Pashtuns, um, who for both Afghan and Pakistani Taliban um, make up about 80, 70 to 80 percent of all Taliban. My experience with living among Pakhtuns, and I'm not a Pakhtun, I'm from a different ethnic group, uh, was that I have not seen any other group which is as hospitable and as friendly um, as Pakhtuns. Um, at the same time, I found among the Pakhtuns um, that they are very, their orientation in principle is very um, religious. But in day-to-day -day affairs, they are not only very pragmatic, but quite secular. Um, I had served as a assistant superintendent of police close to the Sawat Valley in 1997-98. Sawat Valley, if you remember, which were taken over, which was taken over by the militants, uh, who who were beheading and killing people um, on the streets before we had be become aware of this phenomena elsewhere. And I remember it few years before all this crisis had begun, that if you really want, in Pakistan in those days, in 19, and I'm not talking about 1970s, this is late 1990s, that if you want to hear good music, sit beside a stream, um, have a drink perhaps as well, or if whatever you smoke, if you get, want to do that, Sawat was the best place. Um, the way it changed and radicalized uh, uh, was a very, very insightful phenomenon. And this brings me to one of this major theme when I'm referring to Bakhtuns. That having seen them as hospitable, having seen their ethos as that, as very secular, and I may not, I, I can mention only one name, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, Baja Khan, who was called Frontier Gandhi. You can't think that any Pakhtun leader or a Pakistani leader or in that sense uh, was so close to Mohandas Karam Chand Gandhi, the great Indian leader, that people will call him Frontier Gandhi. They used to call him Frontier Gandhi because of his secular ideals, despite being a religious